Great. Okay, you can go to the next slide, actually. Um, so, uh, my name is Nancy Whalen, and I work at the Climate Registry, and my muted today, which is going to take about 20 minutes, is going to just give an overview of what the Climate Registry is, the services that we offer local governments, and, uh, and the energy efficiency program that we have available, which um, has some funding attached to it, so local governments can utilize that. The Climate Registry um, is a nonprofit organization uh, that which, which root, its roots started in California. And so um, uh, it was founded along with AB32 as the California Climate Action Registry. And it was a place where um, local governments and organizations and corporations could uh, report their greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and uh, reductions that they made in, ahead of regulation. Um, so when regulation came along, uh, if people were early actors, they could actually be rewarded for their early actions as opposed to potentially um, dinged for them if they made a ton of reductions and then regulation came along and asked for deeper reductions. So it was set up as a place where people could establish a baseline um, and then um, report any reductions that they made from that. And uh, the what happened was eventually the protocol was very strong that we utilized and our methodology was very transparent and it was third party verified. And the other states in the union uh, approached us and asked us to have registries in their states. And what became um, obvious that would be the most cost effective would be that we just had one uh, climate registry, which is, is what this we have now. So there's 42 uh, U.S. states that form the climate registry and um, six Mexican border states and all the Canadian provinces and territories. And so all these states are measuring and monitoring and reporting their greenhouse gas emissions the same way. And we are the official voluntary greenhouse gas registry for all these states. And so if the states develop um, regulatory programs of their own, um, you, you know, they are, um, you know, going to or have committed to a large extent, if not completely, to utilize the methodology of the climate registry. We are also cited in um, most federal legislation that is proposed at the federal level, uh, in addition to the Securities and Exchange uh, Commission directives, um, as a methodology to be utilized and um, a program to be utilized that would meet the requirements of regulation or the Securities Exchange Commission type of directives. So um, Mary Nichols, uh, so we have one um, board member per state, and it's usually a, um, a high up environmental official, either the uh, secretary of the EPA or um, in the case of California, it's Mary Nichols, who is the chairman of CARB. So she is the uh, chair, our board, our board person for California. We have 420 um, businesses, local governmental and non-GIA, um, local government, I'm sorry, um, nonprofit organizations um, reporting to us at this time. Actually, could you make the slide go, go back again? Thanks so much. Um, and uh, so let's see. I think if there was a few things that I think are important for local governments to know, um, one is that in California, uh, in the scoping plan that CARB has uh, created and spearheaded for AB32, there is nothing in the scoping plan that requires local governments to report their greenhouse gas emissions. Reporting is done on a voluntary basis. And so, um, you know, of course we cannot say what legislation will be in the future, but current and in the foreseeable future, um, it's a voluntary uh, situation for local governments. So, you know, if they um, 
I think that's important to know. This, the second thing that um, we run into a lot is local governments thinking that they will be regulated and also have to reduce their emissions to 1990 levels, which is something that I think we would really like to clarify. Um, is local governments do not have to go back to 1990 levels, and um, they do not have to find data that goes back to 1990 either. So if they're wanting to establish a baseline and then establish reductions from that point, um, just establishing a baseline uh, from a year where you have readily available data would be perfectly acceptable. Um, so I hope I'm not getting too technical, but uh, those are two misconceptions that we run into very frequently, um, the idea of going back to 1990 levels. Um, the state of California as a whole is, is interested in going back to 1990 levels by 2020, which is approximately a 15 percent reduction from 2008 levels. But that includes the entire state of California, so uh, emissions that are coming from uh, multiple sources. Um, so uh, we were um, contracted by the California Air Resources Board to develop a local governmental protocol. Many local governments wanted to have guidance on how to report greenhouse gas emissions. And so we partnered with CARB and ICLEI and uh, developed a working group and uh, a protocol specifically for local governments to be able to report their emissions. Um, this can be found in several places, but it's posted on our website, and it can be downloaded for free, um, theclimateregistry.org. And uh, it's essentially a guidebook for local governments to find their sources of greenhouse gas emissions and how to calculate those sources. So it's a very valuable tool um, for local governments to utilize. and um, Let's see. Um, within this protocol, um, I think it's very important to note this. Um, there is various methodologies that can be utilized for local governments to measure their greenhouse gas inventories. And so there is a preferred methodology, and there is um, an alternate methodology. And I think it's important to make clear that the preferred methodology, which um, is what CARB and the Climate Registry um, uh, support, is that um, you use accurate data versus proxy data. So accurate data is what the um, preferred methodology requires, and proxy data is the alternate methodology. The reason why this is important to note is because, um, and let, I'll explain just for those of you who don't know, the difference between accurate and proxy data. Um, if you're a city and you are going to report your gas usage, but you can't find the utility bills or your records that indicate what your gas usage was, you could, um, let's say you were the city of Santa Barbara, and you couldn't find that information. And you could think, well, you know, the city of Santa Monica is about the same size. I'll call over there and find out what their gas usage was, and then I will substitute it since I can't find mine. That would be proxy data or estimated data. And if you build an inventory that way, you do not come out with an accurate inventory. It's an estimated inventory, which can be useful and can be, um, you know, can be a, a very useful tool to have. However, if you are wanting to have a regulatory quality um, inventory or you are interested in participating in cap and trade, um, you would need to have a more accurate methodology. So I'm uh, bringing this up because a lot of cities and counties are about to embark on creating their inventories. And um, if you're going through the effort of collecting this data and you know inputting it into various software tools or you're wanting to publicly report it, um, 
please, it would be advisable, in my opinion, to find accurate data versus proxy data if you, if you can. Um, because, like I'm saying, it prepares you for um, other, you know, things that you may want to participate in in the future. Um, let's see. Those are, you can turn the slide now. <laughs> So those are actually the biggest things that I wanted to mention. Um, the services that the Climate Registry offers local governments are uh, cost-effective assistance in measuring greenhouse gas footprints. So we help you find your sources, gather your data, and calculate your emissions. We have a support staff um, in-house that is available five days a week to answer any questions people have um, on how to go about doing this. We also have webinars, educational workshops, policy updates, newsletters, and conferences. So we um, are kind of a very high-touch organization. We've um, been doing this for a number of years. Um, we also have user-friendly software and technical support. So we have online software that allows facility managers and your you know, local governmental staff to input their data into the software and it automatically calculates the greenhouse gas emissions conversion software that, um, you know, to help build your inventory. Um, so through this exercise you would be establishing a baseline and then if you had um, reductions that you might want to document, you can also do this here. One reason why uh, local governments want to document reductions is it may uh, be in the future that um, when a cap and trade regime is designed, um, even even if they are even if local governments are not regulated, they may be able to participate in a cap and trade uh, regime because there may be uh, set asides for people that have done outstanding uh, reductions of greenhouse gas emissions, and they may uh, have some credits available to them. This has um, not been developed yet, and since CARB is going to be speaking after me, uh, perhaps they'd like to, um, you know, confirm or add uh, further comments um, about that. But um, anyway, um, so, you know, another useful reason for creating an, an uh, emissions inventory that's accurate um, with the Climate Registry is it is California's um, voluntary registry. We do um, offer an option to publicly disclose emissions. It's not required, but you can. And we do um, also offer third-party verification, though it's also not required, but it's something that um, a lot of people like to have. So um, why would people want to create an inventory um, like this? Uh, one is to demonstrate environmental leadership. Um, another is, like I was saying, to prepare for potential regulation or potential trading. Uh, it I identifies inefficiencies and is a way to identify cost-effective reductions. It's also the first step that local governments take when they are going to develop a climate reduction plan. So, um, you know, the first the first thing that you would do before you cut a dress, let's say, is you would um, measure it. <laughs> and you'd probably measure it twice, <laughs> and then you'd go about cutting. Well, it's the same with greenhouse gas emissions. You, you measure, and you get a, an understanding of your inventory, and then you figure out where you would like to um, invest in making reductions. So um, you can go on to the next slide. Can you go on to the next slide? Um, anyway, um, we, uh, okay, so, sure, this, this is a good slide. Um, so this is just a little bit more about our, uh, you know, our organization. We have just a basic membership which um, offers 
assistance in um, calculating your inventories and uh, collecting the sources and um, just essentially giving you the tools to reduce and measure emissions and also report them, uh, you know, uh, publicly report them if you want to. Then the membership goes up in level and it is climate registered, which requires third party verification. And then um, silver, gold, and platinum, which require reductions to be made, um, achieving higher and higher levels of um, status. Okay, you can go on to the next slide. So this is a sampling of um, some of the local governmental members that are participating in um, the program right now. Um, we also have a slew of local governmental members that are also finishing up their reporting at the California Climate Action Registry. So these are the ones that have moved over to the Climate Registry. So we kind of, there's there's a, anyway, yes, there's, I didn't indicate the others, but um, this is a sampling of the ones that are reporting to the Climate Registry. And you can go to the next slide. And this is a, a sampling of corporations and organizations that also report to us. So we do local governmental work. Um, and we also provide the service to other organizations and corporations. Um, so uh, if you could go on to the next slide, that would be great. We um, also do a lot of work with energy efficiency because um, energy efficiency is the most immediate cost-effective uh, tool to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So um, it oftentimes, uh, you know, usually always pays for itself. And um, so as a result of that, um, the CPUC, the California Public uh, Utilities Commission, um, had supported the um, investor-owned utilities to co-brand with the Climate Registry um, to encourage energy efficiency work and also measuring greenhouse gas emissions and reductions associated with that work. So um, we have a program which is called the Cool Planet Project, and it's hosted at Southern California Edison, who um, spearheaded the effort to design and develop this program. And it is also hosted at San Diego Gas and Electric and the Southern California Gas Company. And so basically it provides local governmental customers a year of complimentary membership in the registry where we help assist you in measuring and calculating, verifying, and reporting your emissions. Um, it also provides funds for third-party verification. So if you want to hire a third party to verify that you did everything correctly. And um, a public relations campaign for local governments to communicate their environmental leadership to the public. So um, because this program is voluntary, um, it is a very uh, large gesture on the part of local governments to step up and um, make the effort to find their emissions and report them and build an inventory. And so we help you communicate that leadership and effort that you make to the public. The um, eligibility to participate in this program is that a local government would install an EE project or projects that save at least 500,000 kWh or 10,000 therms on an annual basis. And um, basically, that's the eligibility. Um, the, the projects have to be installed in um, between, well, I won't go into all the little nitty gritty, but that is the basic eligibility of the program. And you can contact either the Climate Registry or your utility company representative for more details and project eligibility criteria. So um, you can go on to the next slide. Oh, it's my name, me, <laughs> Nancy Whalen. So please give me a call um, in wrapping this up. Um, 
uh, if you have any other questions, you can call me or email me. Um, I guess in summary, the, the things that I wanted to just clarify were that there is nothing in the scoping plan that is requiring local governments to report at this time. Reporting is voluntary, though it's very important that local governments report because they um, really do um, provide a lot of leadership um, for this um, solving this challenge. And so, but anyway, it's not, a, it's not a reporting. Local governments do not have to go back to 1990 levels. Since I hear that almost on a daily basis, I just want to be able to say that that is not, not the case. Um, and CARB will, I'm sure, elaborate on that more. That there is a lot of value in building an inventory that has accurate data uh, versus proxy data. And um, yeah, that's all. I wish you all good luck. And we are happy to be a resource to you. So thank you. Thanks, Nancy. Uh, we actually are a few minutes ahead of schedule, so I'm going to go ahead and take a few questions now. Um, we had a few questions come in over the chat function for you, Nancy. The first one is, I'm with a small local government with limited staff resources and a baseline inventory of 2,000 metric tons of CO2. Would it be worth it for us to participate in the registry in terms of time? What would be the benefits? That's a great question. Um, yes, it definitely would be. Um, the benefits of participating, even if you're a small local government um, or a large one with limited resources, um, to report to the registry is um, not a difficult or time-consuming uh, endeavor. Um, and as I said, we have staff to assist you every step of the way. The benefit would be, um, it would, um, it's a very accurate inventory. Um, if you wanted to verify it, um, it would be regulatory quality. Um, of course, we cannot anticipate every regulation that's coming down the pike. But as I said, we are included in all the legislation for regulation. So I would, um, you know, we're very. Welcome to GoToWebinar, web events made easy to ever participate in cap and trade, uh, it's important that you have an accurate inventory and that it would be third party verified and we offer the ability to be able to do that. Welcome to GoToWebinar, web events made easy. James Goldstein at this point, it's a pleasure to have him Welcome to GoToWebinar, web events made easy. And implementation of regulations and policies adopted by the board, including AB 32, and reviews legislative proposals and technical materials supporting those policies. So I'm going to go ahead and unmute him. James, are you with us? I am. Hi, Kate. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am James Goldstein. I'm the executive officer at the California Air, Resor Re Air Resources Board, and I thought I'd give an overview of uh, where we are at this point on uh, AB 32 uh, implementation, then SB uh, 375, and then we'll turn it over to Tabitha for more detail on SB 375. Uh, as most of you know, uh, next slide, Kate, or whoever's changing the slide. Uh, as most of you know, the uh, California Air Resources Board uh, leads the fight against uh, air pollution, uh, not only in California, but in the United States and in other countries as well, uh, by the uh, fact that a lot of the work that we've done in setting air quality standards has been uh, copied and duplicated around the country and the world. Uh, the board refers both to the agency um, and the group of 11 officials who govern it. We have a 11-member board. They're, they are all gubernatorial appointees. Uh, Mary Nichols is our chairman. Um, she is the only full-time member. Uh, ARB was created in 1967 uh, when smog in the LA basin was, uh, I'm sure many of you remember, uh, uh, obviously unhealthful. Next slide. Our primary uh, legal mandates are to ensure a progress to attain air quality standards. These are federal standards for the most part. 
uh, to reduce public exposure to toxic air contaminants. And uh, in 2006, uh, when, the gov when Governor Schwarzenegger signed AB 32, uh, we added uh, global warming emissions uh, to our charge. Next, next slide. Uh, we should be on uh, California ranks second in greenhouse gas emissions. There we go. So from a global perspective with regard to greenhouse gas emissions, you can see that Californians generate a comparatively large uh, carbon footprint, yet nationally uh, California's greenhouse gas emissions per capita are lower than almost any other state. And as many of you know, the same is true on energy consumption. Uh, the average Californian's electricity consumption has remained virtually unchanged for the past 35 years, whereas nationally it has actually increased by about uh, 50 percent. And uh, Arthur Rosenfeld is the, uh, the uh, uh, person recently retired from the Energy Commission who was the uh, person who made us aware of that starting in the mid-70s. Next slide. In June 2006, um, on United Nations World Environment Day, as it happened, uh, Governor Schwarzenegger declared that the global warming debate is over and that, quote, the time for action is now. Three months later, he signed AB 32 into law. The bill drew wide support, partly because California has had decades of success in controlling auto emissions and promoting energy efficiency. Supporters also said that acting now would help California become a leader in the emerging global market for clean and efficient energy technologies, which we know to be true because of the increase in investment in those technologies over the past several years. Welcome to GoToWebinar, web events made easy. Comprehensive and aggressive controls on greenhouse gas emissions in the country. As you can see from this slide, the law requires that statewide greenhouse gas emissions be reduced to 1990 level by 2020. As you can see from the graph, if that amounts to a reduction of about 15 percent from today's level. And uh, what you look at on the fourth bar, bar over from the left it's the 169 million metric ton of CO2 equivalent reduction, which is what we're trying to get for, uh, to get in the, uh, uh, under AB 32 in the scoping plan. We also have an executive order from Governor Schwarzenegger um, that calls for 80 percent reductions from a 1990 baseline uh, in a business as usual scenario uh, by 2050. Next slide. So AB 32 uh, set very ambitious targets. The law gave ARB uh, a, a great amount of uh, responsibility and latitude to conceive and design what we call the scoping plan, which is our plan uh, outlining the mix of measures that we would use to uh, achieve the AB 32 goals. Uh, next slide. The scoping plan has uh, three separate but integrated approaches to transportation, which accounts for 38 percent of the state's greenhouse gas emissions. That's nearly as much as electricity generation, which is 23 percent, and industrial facilities, which is 19 percent combined. So I know almost all of you, if not all of you, have heard of the proverbial uh, three-legged stool. This is our run at it. <laughs> One leg addresses greenhouse gas emissions from new passenger vehicles. Another limits emissions from vehicle fuels. That's our low carbon fuel standard. And the third leg, as you see, is still a little wobbly. The goal is to cut down the vehicle miles traveled, or VMT. This is uh, our current challenge uh, you know, because it really does depend on uh, the community and the local uh, political leaders to make this happen, to, to really get this done. Whereas on low carbon fuel standard and vehicle work, we can, through our regulatory power, force um, regulatory, uh, force uh, innovation uh, by setting performance standards. At the local level, it really is going to be up to you to meet these important goals. Next slide. Uh, 
Uh, here's a close-up view of the vehicle emissions leg of the stool. The clean cars standard is expected to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from new cars by as much as 22% in 2012 and 30% in 2016. This is a uh, very significant part of our scoping plan and uh, our important part of our objective in reaching uh, our 2020 goals. As you can see, that uh, between now and 2016, we're going to see vehicles with smaller gas engines and better transmissions. Many of them will be uh, turbocharged in a very sophisticated way to make the fuel use much more efficient. We're also going to see more and more and more hybrids out there, and we know the, the vehicle like plug-in hybrids like the Chevy Volt, uh, Toyota is going to be coming out with one. Uh, these are out there as also uh, all electric uh, vehicles like the Nissan Leaf and others are, are coming. Right, next slide. With regard to the second leg, the low carbon fuel standard was uh, adopted in April of 2009. Uh, this uh, will account for a 10% reduction in carbon intensity, uh, which will actually uh, mean about a 20% drop in California's oil consumption by 2020. Uh, we are the third, world's third largest consumer of gasoline, second to China and the United States as a whole. Uh, the high global warming potential gases amount to no more than 3% of the total statewide greenhouse gas emissions, but as the name implies, they are far more potent than uh, CO2 in their ability to warm uh, the environment, and these are very important uh, measures as well. Next slide. So with regard to measures we have under development, uh, we're working on the next phase of our advanced clean cars uh, effort. Um, as I mentioned, Nissan says it's planning to sell about 150,000 of their all-electric LEAF in the United States later this year. It's a major opening for a relatively new technology. Uh, as for fuel cell vehicles, we're looking at about 40,000 to 50,000 of them in 2015 compared with the 100 or so uh, on California's roads today. And of course, uh, you know, GM plans to roll out uh, the hybrid plug-in Volt towards the end of this year or early next year. Uh, our goal is that these advanced clean cars will be widely sold in the U.S. by 2025 maybe upwards of 10% of new car sales, and all will have emissions that are 70 to 90% lower than today's new cars. Next slide. SB 375 is the anti-sprawl component of the scoping plan. The board is scheduled next month uh, on September 23rd to set targets for reducing the greenhouse gas emissions associated with uh, driving in metropolitan areas. The cities will work with their regional planning agencies on strategies for meeting those targets. The scoping plan includes an economy-wide emissions cap on large pollution sources. The uh, board would issue a limited number of emissions allowances with the number of allowances declining over time. That's how the cap-and-trade program will work. Pollution sources such as electric power plants would be allowed to trade allowances and as a result sources able to reduce emissions least expensively take on more of the pollution reduction effort and any excess allowances they have they're able to sell off the trade. Next slide. With regard to uh, principles that we're following for the development of uh, cap and trade, um, we know that people are concerned that the cap and trade policy might increase pollution in low income or minor minority communities. Uh, we've been analyzing that, and uh, so far uh, we have not been able to find uh, any area where that would happen in any uh, uh, significant way. Um, because a cap-and-trade system would reduce California's overall greenhouse gas emissions, it would also lower the state's emissions of any other kinds of co-pollutants, and that's uh, very important to remember. So we, we find that the advantage of the cap is it gives you certainty on meeting your environmental objective and giving companies the ability to compete against each other and trade if they need to or can benefit from that 
can sense early reductions, and this has been proven in other types of cap and trade programs uh, before um, around the, well, certainly in the, the U.S. Uh, next slide. Uh, the Air Resources Board, uh, of course, is a uh, part of the Western Climate Initiative, uh, and as you can see from the slide, uh, it goes quite far east in Canada. Uh, we're still working on getting the middle states, middle provinces in Canada and some of the other states here. We're coordinating our, in the west, our coordin we're coordinating our climate policies with six other states and four Canadian provinces right now. This regional partnership is the Western Climate Initiative. Uh, we, what we hope for is a properly structured nationwide cap and trade program, which um, uh, we are uh, working in Washington and in Ottawa to try to make sure that um, uh, Congress and the Parliament uh, take our lead and actually uh, create national programs that are as strong or stronger than what we've been working on. We've also been working uh, very closely with the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative in the Northeast. That's the nine Northeast states that have an electricity-only cap-and-trade program going on right now, and the Midwestern Governors Accord. And so um, we are working with the other two regions to link the three regions together sometime in the near future. Uh, New Mexico, in terms of timing, New Mexico is currently promulgating their cap-and-trade rule. Uh, British Columbia and California will do it sometime uh, this fall, and we know that Quebec and Ontario are also moving forward on their program as well. Next slide. I'll, I'll uh, end uh, where our next presenter, Tabitha Willman, begins on local government's role. Uh, our job is to implement AB 32, but it's not state regulators who are going to be speeding California's shift to clean, reliable, and efficient energy. We're going to need scientists and engineers and entrepreneurs uh, taking innovations in clean technology out of the realm of policymaking and into the marketplace, again, getting them into our homes and making them available for transportation for us. It's also going to be consumers who uh, will upgrade their home insulation, and demand more efficiency in their heating and air conditioning and buying uh, fuel-efficient vehicles, uh, hopefully with different kinds of fuels. And it'll be local government uh, 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 communities and politicians and business owners uh, making day-to-day -day decisions uh, on their equipment purchases and their planning that will really have a huge impact over the long term uh, on how we uh, transform um, and shift our economy to a more energy efficient uh, uh, economy based on a better technology and better planning. So with that, um, uh, Kate, I can just give it over to Tabitha or do you want me to take questions first? Yeah, I know you're busy and probably have to leave after this, so I was hoping we could get a couple of questions in. As you can imagine, folks are really interested in hearing what happens if Proposition 23 is approved and AB 32 is suspended. We have a couple of questions that deal with that. The first is, since a good chunk of the scoping plan reductions are from state measures, what are the implications should the referendum to suspend AB 32 pass in November? The second question is, Part of the scoping plan covers greening new residential and commercial construction. Is this tied to Cal Green standards that are set to go into place in 2011? If so, will the Cal Green standards be suspended if Prop 23 is approved by the voters? Um, I really can't say much about that, and I don't really want to speculate. I mean, obviously, we are very aware about Proposition 23, but we are uh, moving forward on all fronts, on AB 32 implementation, on SB 375, target setting. Um, and so uh, I think the answer is we're just going to keep moving forward. If uh, the initiative is successful, then we will have to look at what that says and then uh, respond accordingly. I know that's not uh, 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 the answer that people 
want to hear, but we really are focused on getting the work done. Um, and unless it passes, we're not focused on what would happen if it does pass. Okay, great. Thanks, James. We really appreciate you joining us. So Tabitha Willman is going to take over next, and she is the California Air Resources Board's Office of Climate Change Liaison to Local Governments on AB 32 scoping plan measures. For the past three years, she has been working to help local governments understand climate change and the benefits of climate action planning. So with that, I will hand it over to Tabitha. Thank you, Kate, and um, I'd like to thank the Local Government Commission for inviting us here today to talk about AB 32 and what it means for local governments. Um, I hope I can clarify how local governments play an important role in the implementation of the scoping plan and to be able to talk about some of the tools and resources that we've developed to help local governments. I'd also like to thank James for giving a good overview of AB 32 as it kind of um, you know, he gave the broad perspective, and I'm going to delve down a little bit into um, local governments, and I hope that my portion of the presentation can complement what he's already talked about. Next slide. So James has already provided a summary of what AB 32 is and what many of the measures are within the scoping plan. And so what I intend to do in my portion of the presentation is to dive down a little deeper into how the scoping plan applies to local governments. I'd also like to talk about the role we see local governments playing in implementing some of the measures uh, within the scoping plan and some of the resources that are available to help them understand what they can do, um, how they can do it, and where to go if they need some help. And then we will finish off uh, with taking questions. And I think, Kate, you're, if time allows, you're allowing some questions. And then I imagine there will be a little bit of interactive discussion at the end. So next exactly, slide. Yes. So James shared with you the foundation of AB 32 and how many of the measures were identified to reach the greenhouse gas emission reduction goals. And this slide shows again um, what some of the main sectors are for achieving greenhouse gas emission reductions and then what some of those measures, uh, the measure activities and regulations are um, that exist or that are being developed to help reduce emissions. I'd like to reiterate that most of these measures are targeting reductions through the cap and trade program as well as through regulation on specific sectors. While none of these are specifically aimed at local government, local governments really can help California meet our emission reduction goals because they have their arms around um, so many aspects and so many of the different sectors and they touch upon these areas in one way or another. Next slide. So I'd like to start out by noting um, that there are no AB 32 requirements directed specifically to local governments. Um, however, there are measures and regulations within the scoping plan that may apply to or affect local governments, and I've listed some of these on the slide. Some of these measures have already been adopted, and some are still in the process of being developed. As James mentioned, we have um, several going next month in September. Um, and then November are, and December are some big months for us to adopt regulations. Um, some of the measures that have already been adopted um, are listed, and these are ones that may apply to local governments. Um, the first one is mandatory reporting, and that is specifically if a local government owns um, or operates a facility that's considered to be a large emitter of greenhouse gases and is subject to that type of reporting. So examples of these types of facilities include power generating facilities, cogeneration plants. Um, and the cities and counties that have these facilities, essentially they already know who they are and they've already reported. Another um, one of the adopted regulations that may apply to local governments is um, the one regarding high global warming potential gases. And these regulations, are res they restrict the use and handling of high global warming potential gases, such as those that are used in refrigeration and air conditioning units. And these may apply to local government fleet maintenance operations. 
for those uh, regulations that are still under development, um, if a local government operates a public utility, they may also be required to ensure that a certain percentage of the electricity they provide comes from renewable sources, such as wind, solar, or geothermal production. Also, local governments may be required to meet mandatory commercial recycling requirements in their buildings and facilities, and the mandatory commercial recycling um, rule is one that is going to be considered next year. I believe around March is when it's scheduled for to go before the board. Next slide. So again, although the scoping plan doesn't include measures that are aimed specifically at local government, it does recognize the very important role that local government plays in meeting AB 32 goals. We realize that local governments have broad influence and um, sometimes they have exclusive authority over many of the activities that contribute to significant direct and indirect greenhouse gas emissions. Cities and counties touch upon each of the different sectors that are identified in the scoping plan through their planning and permitting processes, through their local ordinances, outreach efforts, and, and even through their ability to lead by example for their community. So many of the scoping, pl scoping plan measures rely on local government actions to help spur the greenhouse gas emission reductions. Through, um, through their own municipal operations, uh, local governments can take action to reduce emissions, and um, many of these actions can be low or even no cost and can help result in cost savings for cities and counties. Cities and counties can also, through their own actions, demonstrate to the businesses that are within their community how um, changes to the operations can save money. They can influence their residents to save money. Um, they can boost the local economy. And a lot of this is through energy efficiency and improved land use and planning decisions. Next slide. So one of the big questions is, what can local governments do to help meet AB 32 goals? And there are two of the main areas uh, that local governments can best facilitate greenhouse gas emission reductions is through land use and urban growth, and then also through climate action planning. SB 375 is a law that uses an incentive to encourage more integrated development patterns and improve transportation planning. It encourages cities and counties to align their development with the sustainable uh, planning strategies. And I'll talk a little bit more about this in the next slide. And another mean by which cities and counties can best affect emission reductions is through climate action planning. And in the scoping plan, um, it specifically called out the roles of local government as essential partners, and really it encourages local governments to adopt reduction goals for their municipal operations, um, and then also to even transition to community um, emission reduction goals. And as um, Nancy had mentioned, you know, one of the important points that she pointed out was that there's, you know, no requirement or not necessarily a need for local governments to take their emission inventories back to 1990, that 1990 is the basis by which the state is looking to reduce its emissions. So, you know, that's why we have our baseline level at 1990. But really what the scoping plan encourages local governments to do is to adopt emission reduction goals that are consistent with the statewide. Um, and while that is about a 30% reduction from 1990 levels, it also equates to about a 15% reduction from today's levels, and, and or at least at the time that the scoping plan was written, which is in 2008. So, um, you know, I, I wanted to touch on what Nancy had said, that really there's, there's no need for cities and counties in conducting their inventories or their baseline inventories to go back to 1990, um, they can use more current numbers and still, you know, gauge their reductions based off of that. So, next slide. So, in taking a closer look at SB 375, um, we can see that there are several requirements. However, none of them fall upon cities and counties necessarily. 
Um, SB 375 does require the Air Resources Board to set regional targets. Um, so we've spent the past year working with the Regional Targets Advisory Committee and also working with the 18 metropolitan planning organizations to establish the greenhouse gas emission reduction targets. Uh, these draft targets were just released last week and the report's now available on our website if anyone wants to look it up. Um, the board will be considering these targets at its, at its September board meeting. SB 375, um, it also requires metropolitan planning organizations to work with local governments to develop what's called a sustainable community strategy, which is essentially an integrated transportation and housing growth plan um, that incorporates strategies to help meet the regional targets that are set by ARB. And here's where the local governments have the opportunity to shape what the sustainable community strategy is and also the policies that are within it. Because the metropolitan planning organizations need the help of local governments to formulate practical and effective land use policies, um, the sustainable community strategy is really the tool by which local governments can use to guide their urban growth and development. Now, um, once these sustainable community strategies are developed, the Air Resources Board has to review these plans um, to determine whether they would, in fact, meet the target if they were implemented. And if ARB determines that they would not, then the metropolitan planning organizations have to prepare an alternative plan that would make, meet the targets. So, um, kind of to summarize, you know, SB 375 provides an incentive for development projects that meet certain criteria. Um, and that they're consistent with the region's sustainable community strategy. So you can see that, you know, there are a couple of requirements within SB 375, but they're not necessarily for local governments. It's really an incentive-based measure to try and facilitate greenhouse gas emission reductions. Next slide. So climate action planning for local governments is another big step um, that towards addressing the greenhouse gas emission reductions uh, for both municipal operations as well as community-wide. And cities and, and counties can join in one of several efforts by taking a climate challenge. And um, many have already done so by signing on to the Mayor's Climate Protection Agreement. And that's kind of a first step towards developing a climate action plan is to determine how much greenhouse gas is emitted in your city or county. Um, both through your municipal operations and then also within your jurisdictional boundaries. So once a city or county has established its baseline inventory of greenhouse gas emissions, the next step is to adopt an emission reduction goal or a target. And the scoping plan, like I mentioned, encourages local governments to adopt um, an emission reduction goal that's consistent with what the statewide goal is, which uh, is approximately a 15% reduction from tape from today's levels. So using the information from your greenhouse gas inventory, cities and counties can um, identify the emission reduction activities and um, develop a climate action plan. And of course, um, this will require implementing policies and measures and then monitoring and verifying that these actions are, are truly resulting in the emission reductions. Next slide. So in order to accomplish developing the Climate Action Plan, um, several resources are available, and this is where the discussion from ICLE and um, the Climate Registry comes into play. For cities and counties who want to quantify their emissions from their municipal operations, um, there needed to be a standardized methodology. And so ARB, in partnership with ICLE um, and California Climate Action Registry, developed what we call the Local Government Operations Protocol. And this is a standard methodology for conducting a greenhouse gas emissions inventory. Um, the Local Government Operations Protocol, or the LGOP as we like to try and shorten it, um, was adopted by ICLE in August 2008. And then it was adopted by the Air Resources Board and California Climate Action Registry in September of 2008. And then it was also adopted by the Climate Registry in June of 2009. So 
ARB, we realized that the local government operation protocol is a complex and kind of a lengthy methodology that many local governments don't have the resources and to spend a lot of time on or money in establishing an inventory. So we wanted to develop a free, easy to use tool that local governments could um, use to get them started on climate planning. So um, earlier this year, we began development of the online inventory tool that, that basically it's an, a calculator that uses the local government operations protocol methodology. And it allows cities and counties to establish a baseline as well as subsequent inventories. Um, and we're hoping to have the tool completed by the end of the year, if not early um, next year. So we've also been working on developing another planning tool that looks at the potential emission reductions that are associated with certain activities. Um, and we're calling this the, the screening tool. And the activities are, some examples are, you know, installing solar panels um, or increasing um, the requirements for uh, building above Title 24 standards. Um, so those are a couple of the different examples. And this tool is not necessarily just for municipal operations. It can also be used at the community level. Um, it it's, identifies potential greenhouse gas emissions. And we're hoping to have this tool also completed around the end of the year, early next year. So um, these are ones that we're working on, and they're going to be part of our toolkit that I'm going to talk about in a, in a couple of slides. So um, next slide, please. So one of the early action measures that were identified in the scoping plan was to provide local governments with information and resources on climate change and planning. So through a partnership with UC Berkeley at California Energy Commission, the California Public Utilities Commission, and Next10, um, ARB worked to develop a local government toolkit, which is on the coolcalifornia.org website. This website was designed to be a one-stop shop of information and resources for local governments on climate action and planning. And some of the resources available on the website include tips on climate action planning. They're is also um, there are also tools and templates and it's they're not specific specific to air resources board we have links to ICLE and we have links to TCR and a lot of the um, resources that are offered by other entities we're we're kind of trying to compile them into one place so that local governments could find everything in a single spot or at least most everything um, also on the cool California website are money-saving actions, um, things that local governments can do uh, to help save money and that will also reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We have case studies and success stories from different local governments listed on there. We also have funding resources, so local governments who are looking to um, get funding for certain uh, planning efforts or uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction projects can go there and see if there's funding available. There are climate calculators. Um, the ones that we are planning on developing or the ones that are in progress are going to be housed on the coolcalifornia.org. And there are also some modeling tools which are available. And um, a lot of the Cool California is linked to other resources. So we've tried to incorporate all of those onto that site. Next slide, please. So finally, I wanted to mention some of the main websites for local government information and resources. Um, through the Air Resources Board's Climate Change Local Government webpage, um, there's a portal that you can access our tools, inventory pro protocols, and also information on SB 375. So in addition to that, you can go directly to Cool California. Um, you can get there through the climate change portal, or you can just go there directly. It's coolcalifornia.org, where you can access many of the links and information on the various local government climate resources. Um, and of course, you can always contact me if you have questions or if you're looking for specific information. I may not have all of the answers, <laughs> but I'll be happy to help find them or point you in the right direction. And um, Kate, that is concludes my portion and thank you for having me. I hope some of the information was um, helpful.
Thanks, Tabitha. Uh, we do have a couple questions, and since we're about five minutes ahead of schedule, I'll go ahead and take those now. There is a couple questions in relation to the commercial recycling. And the first one is, can you elaborate on the mandatory commercial recycling measures? We run our own recycling program, and I imagine we will need to implement the mandatory requirement. And I also had um, a question and comment from Yvonne Hunter with the Institute for Local Government. And I'm, I was going to unmute her so she could ask her own question, but it looks like, oh, there she is. Let's see. Yvonne, are you there? I'm, 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 I'm sorry. There you go. Okay. Um, she had a more lengthy comment, so I'm going to let her voice her own right. <laughs> comment. Hi, Tabitha. Um, thanks for the great presentation. Um, the question I have is, um, and, or maybe it's a clarification regarding um, the piece of the scoping plan that deals with commercial recycling in agency facilities. Isn't it kind of broader than that? Um, in the sense that it, it um, and this is something that Cal Recycle is, is working on, um, as I understand it, it uh, clearly would, would apply to, to local agencies, uh, their own recycling, but I think it also applies to all businesses that generate above a certain quantity of waste, I think it's four cubic yards, and then does require local agencies to um, do outreach and education to those businesses and they can do that either in the form of an ordinance of a just an education and monitoring program there are a number of different options so I just wanted to make sure that that we were all talking about the same thing or is there some other piece um, that you're thinking of um, on that slide Oh, so, sorry, I have Tabitha okay. <laughs> unmuted there because there was some All right, feedback. There we go. There we go. Thank you. I'm back. Um, thank you for an asking that question, Yvonne, and I think they both tie in um, together. You're correct in that what I was referring to with the mandatory uh, re commercial recycling is, in fact, it, um, in process. And actually, I, I don't I know a whole, whole lot about that particular piece, I would recommend that anyone who wants to learn a little bit more go to the Cal Recycle website. It's going to have more detail. Or also go through our ARB climate change website. You can get to the um, commercial recycling component. But you're right, um, Yvonne, it is, I think, a, a little bit more broad than just um, what I had listed on there. It, it, does a, it would apply to local governments who um, have obviously their municipal operations would be affected by the commercial recycling and it also applies to businesses that um, generate a certain amount of material um, it, it, it does include education outreach and monitoring so you're correct and thank you for clarifying that there it is a little bit more broad it's not just local governments it's kind of a um, more broad picture but local governments definitely would be impacted or affected by it. Um, Kate, I don't know, can you hear Can you hear me? I'd like to add one quick comment. Sure, go ahead. Okay, hi, this is Yvonne again, and I'm going to take advantage of this and do a, a quick commercial. Tabitha is absolutely right in her description and also where she can get the information, but the um, Institute for Local Government website has a commercial recycling resource center that we did um, under contract with Cal Recycle and you can get to that from our website or I can give you the URL. Um, we've also done a webinar on getting started for commercial recycling that's archived on the website and we have another one uh, scheduled for October 6th that's focusing on education. Um, so I just wanted to let everyone know about that. Let me give you the, the URL for that. It is www.ca-ilg-commercial-recycling. Great. Thanks, Yvonne. And if you want to send me that link, I can um, post it up for everybody to see. Perfect. I'll, I'll do that now. Thank you.
And we also have a couple more questions for Tabitha before we move on to Ickley's presentation. Um, maybe we can get a little more information from you on the Prop 23 question. This is a slightly different take on it, but in relation to how Proposition 23 will impact um, some of the specific things in the scoping plan, um, the 33% renewable portfolio standard and the low carbon fuel standard, will those be suspended as well? I'm muted. Hi, Kate. Um, you know, and actually, I would defer this question to James, and he just stepped out. I, I can't really speak to um, the proposition or the initiative. One, I honestly don't know how it would be affected, and even if I did, I would hate to speculate. So I know it really is not getting to the questions folks have, but I think we at ARB have probably just as many questions on how it's going to affect us if it is passed. So. I apologize for not being able to answer that. Okay, and then the last two questions we have, one was just on something you mentioned. Um, it says she mentioned something about approximately 15% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. There was a question about that, and they were wondering what those fig what you were comparing those figures to. We actually, when we implement, I'm sorry, not implemented, when we developed the scoping plan, we used the statewide inventory figures, and it was for um, 2004 through 2006 were, were the inventory, so we used the values from that. Um, and then at the time the scoping plan was developed in 2008, we were able to see the business as usual projections. So we took the business as usual from the baseline and projected it out to 2020. And so the 15% is about where we were in 2008, um, considering a business as usual projection. OK, and then lastly, we have a comment. I'm surprised you didn't bring up the new greenhouse gas emissions analysis now required as part of CEQA. Many local governments are still trying to come up to speed on what that will mean for their development projects. I, I'm not sure what the question is on that one. I probably didn't bring it up because I'm not super familiar with it, but <laughs> um, anyway, the, the CEQA is uh, yeah, it, that's not something I know a lot about, so I would be hesitant to speak to that. It, I it, think it's, it's also something... not something that's brought on by the scoping plan. So those are um, some. Am I back on? I just wanted yeah, to note that, that the, that's okay. The CEQA requirements would not be something that would be found as part of the scoping plan. Those are something. Um, through the att attorney general's office and um, you know the and and resources agency. So um, again, that's not something that I'm real familiar with. Great. And Maria, if you had any more clarifications you wanted on that, you can go ahead and send that to me. Um, like Tabitha, Tabitha said, that's not something that the Air Resources Board um, is charged with implementing, so that wouldn't be part of her presentation. But if you have any other clarification, I can get that to the right folks. So up next, we're going to hear from ICLE. We have Michael Schmitz with, uh, with ICLE, Local Governments for Sustainability. He's the California Director. Michael is engaged in supporting cities and counties to take action to reduce CO2 emissions and adapt to the impacts of climate change. He is an attorney with over two decades of experience in policy and politics at the federal, state, and local levels. And he will be um, co-presenting with Jennifer Ewing Thiel, who is the director of ICLE's Tools and Technical Innovation Division and oversees the development of ICLE's greenhouse gas emissions management protocols software and consulting services. So please welcome both of them. And I will try and unmute them so they can talk. Mike, are you with thanks, us? Thanks, Kate. Yes, thanks for, thanks for inviting us, and particularly thanks for the, to the Local Government Commission for organizing and hosting this webinar. It's clearly 
uh, one that is of great need and answers a lot of the questions that local governments are facing. And thanks also to all the those who are on the call, because all of you are out there providing leadership through your actions you know, at the local level to the state and the nation. As Kate mentioned, I'm Michael Schmitz. I'm the California Director of ICLEI, Local Governments for Sustainability. And joining me for this webinar from New York, Jennifer ewing Seal, who is our Director of uh, Tools and Technical Innovation. Next slide. Let me provide a little background on ICLEI Network, and I'll try to move through this because we have a few slides. Um, ICLEI, Local Governments for Sustainability, is the leading nonprofit membership association of local governments committed to climate protection, clean energy, and sustainability. Formed in 1990, ICLEI has an international membership of over 1,200 uh, cities and counties with local government members and offices on every inhabited continent. Next slide. ICLEI's mission has been clear for over 20 years to build serve and drive a movement of local governments to advance deep reductions in greenhouse gas emissions and achieve tangible improvements in local sustainability. All of ICLEI's work is done with the overarching goal of making real gains in the global effort to achieve sustainability. <clears throat> ICLEI is continuously looking for ways to drive our mission forward through improving services and offerings to the member network. We're dedicated to helping members achieve their sustainability goals and always looking for new and better ways to achieve them. Next slide. ICLEI USA has experienced increasingly rapid growth as more local governments across the nation take on the challenges associated with climate protection and sustainability. ICLEI now has over 600 cities and uh, counties as members across the U.S., representing more than 30% of the U.S. population. California has the largest membership of any region with 145 local government members from across the state. California staff are now located statewide with offices in the Bay Area and San Diego and just being joined by our newly opened Los Angeles office. Next slide. So how, do, how does ICLEI help you as a local elected official or staff? Well, ICLEI is the only organization that provides all of the necessary tools, resources, and technical guidance needed to help local governments achieve their sustainability and climate protection goals. ICLEI tools and resources assist members along every step of the five milestone process geared towards achieving GHG reductions and sustainability. Current ICLEI members have access to a wide range of our targeted toolkits, guidebooks, trainings, and other resources, as well as on-demand technical assistance. Jennifer will go into greater details uh, in her part of the presentation. In addition to cutting-edge tools and technical assistance, members can be part of impacting policy at the national and international level. California ICLEI members will also be part of a new engagement strategy in Sacramento, working with policymakers to spur local action throughout the state. Next slide. ICLEI is proud and honored to be part of the new Statewide Energy Efficiency Collaborative, or SEEK, a new alliance to help cities and counties reduce greenhouse gas emissions and save energy. SEEK is a collaboration between three statewide nonprofit organizations, ICLEI, the Local Government Commission, and the Institute for Local Government, and California's four investor-owned utilities, PG&E, San Diego Gas and Electric, Southern, Cal Southern California Gas Company, and Southern California Edison Company. The collaborative effort is designed to build upon the unique resources, expertise, and local agency relationships of each of the nonprofit organizations, as well as the four investor-owned utilities. Next slide. As part of delivering uh, ICLEI's uh, part of the contract, uh, ICLEI will be providing a series of trainings and a suite of energy efficiency and GHG emissions management tools to local governments throughout California. The trainings and tools comprise a set of guidance that will enable local governments statewide to develop greenhouse gas emissions inventories, establish emissions reduction targets, develop climate action plans, and take concrete steps to reduce energy consumption and GHG emissions. Next slide.
Well, actually, I will quickly actually move beyond this. Hickley Services, this is, this is something we can talk about. Anybody who's interested can contact us later. But I want to move into the slide after this next slide and have Jennifer talk about the particular the tools and resources which are available uh, through ICLEI. Jennifer? Mike, can you speak up a little bit? Hi. Yes. There we go. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. This is Jennifer ewing Teal with ICLE. Um, I'm the Director of Tools and Technical Innovation. I'm just going to give you all a quick overview of, of the software tools um, and resources and programs uh, that we offer for our local government members. Um, as you can see here on the next slide, um, we offer a, a suite of tools and resources around um, climate mitigation, climate adaptation, and sustainability. Um, all Jennifer, of these we're going to need you to speak up a little bit, too. Okay. Um, all of these are built around our five milestones for climate mitigation. If you can go to the next slide. Um, so as some of the others have talked about, um, which is you know a pretty typical process of doing a greenhouse gas emissions inventory, establishing a target, um, developing a climate action plan, implementing the plan, and monitoring and evaluating your implementation progress. We have a, a suite of tools, um, best practices, and other and guidance around these five milestones. And what we also do is we recognize um, our local government members' achievements uh, when they um, when they complete one of these milestones. We recognize it's a lot of work to do an inventory, to establish a target. Um, to get the you know political buy-in to an announce a target, all of that. So we we really want to recognize achievements for making progress along the way. Uh, moving on to the next slide, our um, our sort of flagship resource is our clean air climate protection software for doing a greenhouse gas emissions inventory. Um, it was originally developed in the late 1990s, and we've continued to build on it and um, innovate. We're actually about to release a new version of it, um, version 3.0, which will make CACP um, fully compliant with the local government operations protocol and will also include some new um, data import and reporting functionality. Um, and as some of the others have already mentioned, moving on to the next slide, um, ICLE has also been involved in the development of a number of different greenhouse gas emissions protocols for local governments. Um, initially, the local government operations protocol, uh, which we developed in partnership with the Climate Registry, the Air Resources Board, and the California Climate Action Registry. Um, this was released in 2008. Um, so this obviously covers the government operations piece of, a, of an inventory. What we're working on now is developing a community protocol which um, will be used for doing a, a citywide or countywide level greenhouse gas emissions analysis. Um, we're just beginning the development of this. We've got about 100 people from around the country involved in the development of the community protocol. And we anticipate um, releasing the draft of this community protocol early next week. Uh, excuse me, early next year. <laughs> um, Another thing that we're just beginning to kind of lay the framework for is guidance uh, um, for accounting and quantifying actual emissions reductions. Um, since at the end of the day, this is really what we are working with our local government members to help them achieve is, is real reductions in emissions. Um, and then to also provide them with the tools and resources they need to actually account for those reductions. So that's something we're beginning this year that will carry on into next year. Moving to the next slide, um, the next tool, um, our Climate and Air Pollution Planning Assistant, um, CAPA tool, is an Excel-based tool with over 100 measures, which can be used for both our Milestone 2 and 3 for developing a target and developing a climate action plan. Um, it has best practices information for these 100 measures, um, and it allows for scenario modeling and comparison of measures. Um, which is it's a great resource to enable a local government to begin their climate action plan and to also help them understand what measures are needed to achieve their emissions reduction target. Moving on to the next slide, um, we've recently announced a partnership um, with Hurrah Software. Um, this complements our um, existing software tools, but not only provides um, a software tool for milestones one, two, and three, it's really a comprehensive suite of modules 
for um, that enables the local government to not only you know develop and manage their climate action plan, but really monitor and report on their implementation progress. Um, Hara is our um, preferred partner for um, enterprise level greenhouse gas emissions management software. There's more information on this on our on our website, but this is um, basically the, a best in class software tool for um, local governments with more demanding needs. Um, to manage their energy and emissions information. On the next slide, just a brief overview of our climate adaptation program um, called Climate Resilient Communities. This is a relatively new program for us. Um, and again, through the adaptation program, we are developing a suite of tools, um, best practices, and guidance on um, to help local governments plan and adapt for um, the changing climate. We're also working on developing a software tool called ADAPT, um, which will be a database of best practices and guidance uh, to facilitate uh, performing a vul vulnerability assessment and developing an adaptation plan. On the next slide, um, another program we have in development is our uh, for our sustainability uh, department is our STAR Community Index. Um, this is a performance management system and rating system for local governments to, that will include a, a standard set of sustainability indicators. Um, it, it includes nearly 100 sustainability goals um, and associated performance measures and targets. This is also currently in development um, with over 100 uh, experts from around the country feeding into this um, and, and will be released in the summer of next year. Um, that just provides a, a quick overview of all of our resources, just moving to the last slide. Um, you can certainly find a lot more information about ICLE and all of our resources on our website at icleusa.org. And Michael and I would also be happy to um, touch base with you offline um, to answer any questions you might have about ICLE. Um, and, and I think we have some time for a few questions now. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Jennifer and Mike. We have a few questions for both of you, and then we also have some questions that I didn't get to for Nancy um, that we'll move on to as well. Uh, the first question is, how does ICLE's inventory process for local governments, based on the so same protocol as TCR, fit in with TCR's comments of accurate, not proxy-based inventories? If there is a gap, would third-party verification help? Um, yep, this is Jennifer. I'll take that. Um, we also strongly recommend that our local government members follow the recommended methods in the local government operations protocol. So there really shouldn't be any gap between um, it, it's one protocol and then there's an appendix for ICLE and for TCR with our various reporting requirements, which are very similar for our different programs. So. A local government who's following the recommended methods in the local government operations protocol should have uh, um, an inventory that can be verified um, if, if they're interested in doing that. So we, we certainly promote a, a consistent approach with um, the local government operations protocol and, and the partners involved in developing it. And, and to follow up just for anybody who is considering this, we're strong supporters of the climate registry and the path-breaking work they're doing um, uh, across North America. Nancy, do you want to add anything? Um, sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, yeah, I'd just like to say that um, because the protocol, if you haven't read it, it's a very technical document. and. Um, the thing that I think should be stressed is within that protocol, um, which may not be obvious with ICLE's software tool or the registry software tool or CARB's upcoming software tool, but it is obvious within the um, protocol itself is that there is a preferred method and then an alternate method. And, you know, what everyone is saying, Michael and Jennifer at ICLE and, um, and Tabitha over at CARB and what we're saying is local governments are strongly encouraged to 
report the preferred method. And what that means is that you would utilize accurate data versus proxy data because you're already going through a lot of effort to gather this information and create a footprint. And it, it doesn't take that much more effort to find the actual data. You already have it. A lot of it is, 90% of it would be you're in your utility bills, which you can get from your utility companies. And so to come out with an accurate inventory, it, um, it helps you, like I'm saying, if you wanted to participate in cap and trade, if you were ever to be regulated, um, if you ever wanted to verify an inventory, an estimated inventory is simply not as strong, and that's what you get when you use proxy data. So I just think that distinction is important for people to understand, or if you're having other people, consultants, interns, people like that, doing your inventory for you, you want to see what type of data they're collecting and where they're getting it from so you understand what your inventory is made of. There's many cities that you they don't know, like they have an inventory but they don't know what it actually is and it's important that you know. So that's all. Thank you. Thanks Nancy. <laughs> we have a question from Wayne Longden who's asking what kind of recognition do you award communities with? Um, That's for Eggly. Oh, okay, sorry. Mike, do you want to take that one or shall I? Okay, Jen. Okay. <laughs> um, so we, I guess we provide multiple different levels or types of recognition. Our um, primary method of recognition is through our milestone awards. Um, which I, I think I mentioned earlier that you know we give out milestone awards, um, certificates, or a trophy for achieving um, or completing one of our milestones. That, so that's kind of a, um, our more formal approach um, towards recognizing achievements at our local action summit, um, which we I forgot to mention um, coming up this September 24th and 25th in Washington D.C. We're also going to be um, recognizing achievements through um, a variety of different um, climate and sustainability innovation awards. Um, but another way we, we recognize achievements is, is just through our network and on our website, um, promoting the successes of our local government members and learning um, and disseminating their best practices, turning a lot of those best practices into guidance and resources. Um, and, and that's really on a day-to-day -day what we're doing to promote the successes of our members and to also help share the successes um, to local governments around the country. Great. Uh, there are a few questions relating to charges. Um, do one of you want to talk a little bit about the fee structure at ICLEI? Um, we also have a question if, asking whether hurrah is free and maybe distinguishing um, the programs that you're offering through the SEEK partnership and then your, your separate member programs and fee structures. Sure. Well, first on the membership, somebody should, uh, whoever is interested in it, I encourage anyone who is not a member to, to contact one of us directly. Um, there are actually quite reasonable membership uh, fees, which I can go into detail, based on uh, population. Um, but in terms of what, what ICLE is going to be delivering to um, through the SEEK contract, it's, it's all going to be free and it's going to be available to all local governments throughout the state. Um, so that's, you know, I think it's a really exciting opportunity from our perspective to be able to um, help build the movement statewide in a way that wouldn't be possible without, uh, you know, the, the invaluable support of the investor-owned utilities and working collaboration with, you know, LGC and ILG. So we're really excited about that opportunity. Obviously, there's a lot of things you can get out of being a member of the network, um, you know, in terms of all the things we laid out and also just in terms of of the power of being part of a network where you're organized with with um, a lot of the leading uh, players in in this field internationally, so the, you can contest us directly though in terms of the, the particular things. But but uh, that those are there are differences and the, the key difference is everything through the SEEK contract on energy efficiency is going to be given out free. So as I said, very excited about that. Great, and Mike or Jennifer, if either of you want to send me a link that has some information about the the fee structures, or yeah, there you go. 
There's both yeah. of their emails if you want to contact them directly. There are a couple questions um, relating to non-local government partners. Will ICLE partner with private consultants to prepare a local government greenhouse gas reduction plan? Um, and another question is, in order to receive ICLE support and resources, do you have to be a local government? Is there is it available for conservation organizations leading a regional effort to develop a climate plan? I can take the consulting question first, and then, Mike, if you want to maybe speak about our regional affiliates. Um, so as part of the services we provide, we do occasionally um, work with uh, private consultants um, or independently on a consulting basis to develop greenhouse gas emissions inventories, um, climate action plans, and sustainability plans for our members, um, and, and occasionally for non-member um, local governments as well. So if, if someone, if that question was posed by a, a consultant, um, you know, feel free to reach out to me just for any um, consulting-related questions. We also have just for the local governments on the phone, um, sample scopes of work and that sort of thing you can use if you're crafting an RFP. Um, that's often really helpful. A lot of our members like to take advantage of that. <clears throat> Mike, do you want to just speak to the um, regional affiliates? Yeah, what, we, what Jennifer's referring to is ICLE is a membership association, and we're, we are geared towards delivering value to the member network, and that's defined as cities and counties. Uh, however, we, we're, we're also launching a new initiative to have as an affiliate, uh, which will give access to a, a number of our tools and trainings, um, regional planning organizations, uh, uh, COGS, uh, regional planning organizations, and others that, that are working directly and part of, in particular in California, part of the SB 375 implementation effort. And, and through the affiliate process, they can they can uh, gain access to key resources and guidances and, and, and tools to be able to assist that. We think that you know, regional efforts are going to be critical in this next period of time. Increasingly, in California in particular, is going to lead the way on this. And, and we're going to try to figure out ways to really help those regional agencies and planning organizations who are diving in there and, and trying to move forward that, that third leg that um, James uh, elucidated in terms of uh, how we're going to drive forward uh, reductions through transportation and land use. So we're excited to contact me about that as well. Great. A couple questions on the measures protocol. One person asked whether the local government operations protocol being referred to by a couple of the different speakers was the one that um, she, want, she wants to know if the current version was the version released May 2010, the 1.1 version. Um, yep, the most recent version of the local government operations protocol is the version 1.1 that, yep, was released in May 2010. Um, and then the, the measures protocol or measures guidance I mentioned, that's something that's really still kind of in the conceptual stage right now, and um, we're also looking to WRI to release some high-level guidance soon on um, performance management and, and accounting for emissions reductions. So that's something we, we plan to work on, and it will be kind of a complementary um, either protocol or set of guidance related to the local government operations protocol and community protocol. Okay, so part of that was if there was a schedule, and it sounds like you may not be that far along. Um, the other part was, is there going to be an opportunity for stakeholder input for the measures protocol? Um, yep. There, so with the community protocol, we have um, formed a, a steering committee and a number of technical advisory committees, and, and we plan on doing the same with the measures protocol, um, really launching that early next year um, with the goal of completing that you know, by the end of next year. And yes, yeah, so we absolutely plan on, um, you know, working with um, whichever partners are interested in being involved, and then with, um, you know, a nice cross section of um, stakeholders from local governments and from um, other sort of related organizations. Great. Um, there was a question about the work that CAPCOA is doing um, on 
mitigation reduction measure quantification. And this person wants to know if you all are working with CAPCOA or are these two separate efforts? Um, we haven't spoken with them yet, I don't think, except for maybe high-level exploratory conversations. But yeah, I think we will be absolutely looking to other entities in, in California and around the country who are developing similar guidance or have sort of aligned um, goals with, you know, having consistent guidance for um, calculating emissions reductions. We're not really looking at the type of guidance comparable to, like, um, off, you know, what you would need to do to create a, a carbon offset, not that sort of verifiable level of guidance necessarily. Um, there, there's sort of different levels of rigor, I think, in quantifying an actual reduction separate from your baseline. So we're, we're just in the process right now of, of exploring that and, and who the right partners would be. But um, yeah, we'll absolutely plan on reaching out to CAPCOA. Uh, on, a, on a separate note also, I wanted to let folks know that uh, we're going to be working and uh, reaching out to CAPCOA and others to give more detailed and better guidance on how to uh, navigate the thicket of issues relating to CEQA that local governments are facing. And that's, that's one we feel like uh, of particular significance now, um, both as SB 375 is rolling out and as uh, increasingly uh, you're seeing uh, general plan updates being done with uh, the new uh, CEQA guidelines in place. So that's something we look, look to um, come back for uh, more information soon on that. Uh, and, and partnership with uh, the leading organizations in the state. Great. We have um, a question here asking for some more clarification on the difference between ICLE and the Climate Registry. Um, the comment is they sound like they're doing almost the same thing. Can we hear from both Nancy and either Mike or Jennifer on some of the key differences between your two organizations? Nance, you want to go first? You want me to go first? Hello. Well, uh, frankly, we think the Climate Registry does does fantastic work. So, in terms of uh, in terms of their role, I don't I don't want to comment other than they're doing they're 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 industry leaders. You know, they they have been, and it's and it's also comes out of the leading role the state of California has played uh, internationally. Um, so, you know, I so I don't know, Nancy. Did you have something you wanted to? Can you hear me? I'm not sure. Hello? Yeah, you're unmuted. Okay, cool. Yes. Um, yeah, I think um, I think one of the main differences between the two organizations is that um, the climate registry focuses solely on accurate data, and so um, you know we and you know, that that is really all we accept and it's all we support and it's all we train the local governments to do. And the local governments historically that have reported to Cal in California voluntarily um, through our organization or using um, public goods funds to do so have always reported that way um, with accurate data. And as I've said before, we think it's very important for them to prepare them for, um, you know, various regulations or cap and trade or business activities that may uh, come on down the road. Um, Mike, feel free to correct me if I'm if I'm wrong. I think ICLE um, in, also encourages um, local governments to report accurate data, but they also uh, welcome local governments that cannot uh, find that type of data and so they accommodate them, you know, through other means too. So when we develop the local government reporting protocol with CARB and ICLEI, uh, we were developing it for California and we were developing it for California, you know, cities and counties that are leaders in the world. And, um, you know, frankly, you know, the way California does business is, um, is, a, is a leadership kind of a role that we assume, and um, 
Ickley in particular had a history of servicing the rest of the United States that, um, you know, somewhere, let's say in Nebraska, they just, their utility company is not providing them with the data and they might not have kept those records, let's say, and they were ha have a very difficult time in finding them and not a lot of support to report their emissions. So Ickley felt that it was very important that they were able to do something rather than nothing and, you know, to get their feet wet and move forward. And so um, that, Ickley in particular, advocated for, to have the um, alternative methodology included in the local government protocol. I believe CARB, in talking, talking to Tab, uh, Tabitha, um, you know, does also agree that they should support, uh, you know, the, you know, accurate data, but if, if it cannot be found, um, the tool that they're developing will allow for estimated data. So I think that that is really one key difference. The other is that the um, Climate Registry Program does allow for third-party verification. So we have a whole program that if an organization wanted to third-party verify and it wasn't just like the accepting of their word for this is what their emissions are, but they wanted to have it third party verified, we offer an avenue to be able to do that. Um, also, this is just all we specialize in. We specialize in the, um, you know, measuring of carbon footprints, um, uh, whereas ICLE does um, offer other services in addition to that. Um, primarily, we specialize in that. We do offer tools for reductions, but um, we don't do the extensive planning um, for reductions that I believe ICLE offers. Um, lastly, I did not cover how much we cost because somebody had asked, like, if we were a little organization, a little city with not a lot of money. Our fees um, start at seven hundred and fifty dollars. So um, I just wanted to say that as well. So thank you, Mike. I don't know if I. Did you a fair uh, shake on this, or if you want to add anything further? Um. Um, thanks, Nancy. I no, we, we we completely agree on the importance of accurate data, uh, and and strongly encourage uh, local governments when they go through these process to use the preferred methodology because for the very reasons that that Nancy uh, laid out, uh, particularly as as uh, the cap and trade market gets developed as uh, cities and counties look forward either to potential implications uh, without speculation uh, of that. Uh, ICLE is not a, ICLE is not a registry. The climate registry is uh, third-party verification. If you're looking to go down that route, that's the place to go. Um, we, we think they've, they've been the industry leader. They provide the, um, a whole range of protocols to private sector firms looking to do that, and they do an outstanding job. Uh, ICLE is, as I mentioned a number of times, a member network uh, that benefits from the peer-to-peer -peer learning, benefits from uh, technical resources, benefits from the kind of both the history, the living history of all those who are part of it, and uh, working, frankly, very closely with all the many others who are in this space. Uh, and that's that's one of the things I think is so exciting about being part of this movement is is uh, you, there are so many. Uh, dynamic, creative organizations that are that are driving this work forward. You know, so that, that without getting into any more, just to say that it's a, a great time to be moving this forward. I'm glad everybody on the call was able to join us. So I hope that there are a lot of questions uh, that have been answered, and that further questions, people feel free to reach out to us. Uh, I think it's there's a lot of work to be done, uh, but if anywhere it can be done, it's going to be done in California. And I really do want to particularly note that, that the leadership role of the CARB uh, has been and continues to be the leading, uh, the leading light. And I will put in a, a two cents about uh, if the if AB, I mean if the uh, ballot measure Prop 23 passes, look to CARB to continue the leadership. Uh, and and uh, the state of California has, in the face of uh, stalling uh, at the uh, international level, in the face of stop and go at the national level, California continues to lead. So we're very fortunate to be here in California doing this work now, and I'm, I'm glad that we had the opportunity to talk to you today. Thank you. 
We do have a few more questions. We are running a little short on time. And for the questions that don't get asked, um, I will be emailing these to the folks that they're intended for. So we will get these questions answered, and we will um, post those on our website. I wanted to get a couple of the questions in for Nancy at the Climate Registry that we didn't have time to in the in the beginning after her presentation. A couple of folks wanted to know if the Cool Plan Planet project exists in the PG&E territory. No, it does not. Though the Edison territory extends up to Tulare County in some cases, so it does go up around that area. But um, at this time, PG&E is not opting to offer the program. OK. Another person asked, they said, did I hear you say that you can help cities develop outreach programs to help them educate their citizens? Are there monetar monetary resources available for those? Um, there are some in development at this time, which um, I can't speak of at this very moment because we haven't launched it yet. But um, we do offer, through the Cool Planet Project, PR campaigns for cities. And so um, what we write uh, press releases for them outlining um, their activities that they've done through energy efficiency that result in greenhouse gas reductions. And um, we garner news articles for them. And we also write success stories for them and so um, that we disseminate and they also can utilize for their own purposes. So um, we do uh, we do it in we do it in that way. Um, also, something I forgot to, to mention just a moment ago is that the registry is the is California is the state of California's official greenhouse gas registry. And so, if cities want to like report their emissions, this is the place where they do it. So after they get an inventory, if they care to like report it publicly, or um, measure their reductions that may be able to be accepted into like a cap and trade regime. This is this is the the place that you this is the only place actually that you would do that. Great. Another question we had for you is what is the relationship between CRIS, the Climate Registry Information System, and CARIP? Um, Chris was uh, is basically like the next iteration of Carrot, so it um, you know took a lot of the um, elements of Carrot and then it enhanced them. Um, so that's the relationship. It's the Ca California Climate Action Registry used Carrot, and the Climate Registry is using Chris. It's a software tool. OK. Here's a question asking, why are Alaska and Texas not part of the registry? <laughs> um, well, I think you'd have to ask the governor of ta uh, Texas and Alaska um, for, to get a good answer on that. But um, though they are not part of the registry, um, many, um, many of their leading um, companies are, particularly in Texas. Um, the, I don't know if it would be the majority, but close to the majority of their um, probably electric producers and oil companies um, uh, are part of the registry or were part of the California Climate Action Registry. So even though um, the state itself is not part of it, a lot of their leading um, organizations are, including cities like the city of Austin is a, is a member. OK, and then lastly, given that local governments are not regulated under AB 32 or other regional frameworks, and given that the complexity of municipal operations does not lend itself well to the GRP, why should local governments continue reporting to the Climate Registry? Um, could, you, could you repeat that question? I'm sorry. Given that local governments are not regulated under AB 32 or other regional frameworks, and given that the complexity of municipal operations does not lend itself well to the GRP, why should local governments continue reporting? 
to TCR? Um, well, let's see. I think that several of us covered why uh, uh, folks would want to measure, calculate, and calculate their emissions. Um, obviously, it's the first place you go to before you would make reductions. And so the registry program, um, in addition to ICLEI and what CARB is, is developing, uh, does help people calculate and um, calculate their emissions footprint. So that would be one reason. And then why you would do that, even though you're not regulated, would be to inform yourself because you want to take action on reducing your emissions. You want to demonstrate uh, environmental leadership. Uh, you would want to be a responsible community. I would say those are some reasons. Um, there is potential regulation down the road from uh, in the future. Or you might want to uh, participate um, in a potential cap and trade regime. So those would be the reasons. Um, secondly, I don't think that everyone would agree that the complexity of local governments lends itself well to the GRP. Um, we, uh, you know, had a large stakeholder group, including CARB and ICLEI, to develop the GRP specifically for local governments. And um, you know, to provide specific guidance. And so many local governments find it really helpful to use the GRP, which is what I believe ICLEI software's tool is based around and they're, you know, utilizing in their program and, and same with CARB. So I think we all did our best to uh, create a do guidance document that would be helpful. Um, additionally, just to make the distinction, um, the, the local government uh, reporting protocol uh, is for what cities own and operate. So it, it ends there. Um, that's its scope. It's not a community level reporting protocol, which ICLEI is spearheading the development of, and that's what Jennifer was talking about. And so I just think it's important to make that distinction. The community level protocol is actually going to be substantially more complex because it revol it re you know it's uh, it's going to revolve a lot of estimated data and um, it's it's what is essentially to some degree out of control of, of cities and lo you know local governments um, you know transportation issues and um, emissions of of, the, of that nature so um, it's more like what the populace in the community emits. Um, so I just thought that with clarification might be helpful, too. Great. Thank you, Nancy. Um, a couple other things I wanted to point out before we adjourn. Um, someone asked a question about local government funding sources to support climate action plan development and implementation. And I did want to just note that the Strategic Growth Council planning grants um, you can use those for climate action plans and also for implementation such as zoning code updates. So I'll send out a link to their website and those are, avail those are um, due at the end of the month. Also, the Institute for Local Government just came out with their Beacon Award program that I just wanted to highlight, um, which recognizes and celebrates California cities and counties that reduce greenhouse gas emissions, save energy, adopt policies and programs to address climate change and promote sustainability. And I just put that little blurb um, up for everybody to see along with the link to their website so you can check out that program. So with that, thanks to all our speakers for sharing with us today and thanks to everyone who tuned in to the webinar. I really hope that you found it useful. Please take a few minutes to fill out the survey. As I mentioned, your input will assure that we continue to offer events that cover the topics you're most interested in. Lastly, I hope you're able to join us for the Statewide Energy Efficiency Forum in October. It will be a great opportunity to hear about cutting edge energy efficiency programs from local governments across the state. So that concludes our webinar today. Thanks for joining us.